Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, if you want a record that you can move to, he's got one. Here is the captain. That's right. Move and groove to. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are featuring Hair Razor by Exhibit A Brewing Company. Hair Razor is an imperial double India pale ale with grapefruit peel, mango, and peaches. Pour it into your favorite glass as it is a beautiful bright orange color. Delicious. ABV 8% garage grade, 4 out of 5 bottle caps. And here's some thanks and praise and some cheers to our friends. First up, a big shout out to Billy Farrier at sharp honda and last but certainly not least we have a i love you guys coming from leah and noonan georgia everyone we just mentioned they went to our website truecrimegarage.com clicked on the pint glass and helped us out with this week's beer run yeah b-w-e-w-r-u-n beer run make sure when you go to the website truecrimegarage.com that you sign up on the mailing list and colonel that's enough of the beers Niels. all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Simone Reidinger was 17 going on 30. She was mature for her age, maybe a little rebellious, but definitely hardworking and smart. At 17, she was already trying to make her way in this world, carving out her own path as she advanced into young adulthood. But life can move pretty fast sometimes, and that most certainly was the experience of Simone's family friends, co-workers, and unfortunately, the members of law enforcement that have worked Simone's case. You see, Simone disappeared back in the late 70s. She was last seen outside of her place of work, the Rainbow Restaurant, a nice, quaint joint favored by the locals. The Rainbow Restaurant fed the good people and probably a few of the bad ones as well in the town of Natick, Massachusetts. The Rainbow was open for breakfast and lunch, but by mid-afternoon, it was closing time and the end of a shift and a day's work for the wait staff and cooks. Today, it's a bagel shop located at 9 South Main across the street from Natick Common. The perfect location for a window pane facade. And in 1977, a perfect central location to meet up with someone after work or a great pickup spot for a ride somewhere. Maybe even a ride out of town. This is the still very solvable missing persons case of Simone Ridinger. And this is True Crime Garage. Simone Reidinger was last seen in the afternoon of September 2nd, 1977. A lot of the reports out there will say that she was last seen sometime between noon and 4 p.m. on September 2nd, 1977. But that news is old news. Here is what we know. Here's what we now know to be what the investigators believe to be true. The true events of that day. The day in question. September 2nd, 1977. This day was a Friday, the Friday leading into the long holiday weekend for Labor Day, 1977. Simone was a little more into adulthood than most are at the young age of 17. She already had a job and she already had an apartment. Unfortunately, what Simone needs is an automobile. 
And I don't say that to be flippant about this situation, but rather to be suggestive of how things may have played out here in this still missing persons case. Like you said, Simone is 17 years old. She's about 5'2", 115 pounds. Yeah, and one thing you and I were talking about off mic here was this case sticking around. And I think that this is the appropriate time in the show that we should hand out an attaboy and some very much well-deserved praise and thank you because when this case first broke, there was not a lot of information regarding the disappearance of Simone. In fact, we will see and go through some of the complications of this case, especially early on in the investigation. But what we are going to see in this case is the Sherborne Police Department and the detectives that stuck with this case over the years. And what they did is they reached out to the media, local and otherwise. It's the old help me to help you scenario. Sherborne PD comes out from time to time periodically and talks with the newspapers. They talk with the local news stations and they say, here is what we know. Here is what we think about this case, and here is what we would like to know about Simone Reidinger and the events of that day or even weekend. Please let us know what you know, because there, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of blank spots in this timeline, and the only way that this case is going to get solved is for information to come forward, new information. And the attaboy goes to the police department and the detectives that have worked this case over the years for taking this information to the public and saying, hey, here's the story of this young woman who went missing. We are looking for information from the public. And that has yielded information time and time again when they've reached out to different media sources. And that is something that doesn't happen in every jurisdiction. Now, there are a lot of cases out there that sadly someone goes missing in the 70s and the case, it drops from the news eventually and people move on. The story goes away. Information stops coming in. Simone's case is different because of the actions of the Sherborne Police Department. So over the years, they have put out there a lot of what they know about the case. And every time they seem to find a new lead, or more importantly, someone with additional information, someone who saw Simone, someone who knew her. So for years, they had the info of, well, Simone was last seen sometime between noon and 4 p.m. on that September 2nd. Right. And later, after reaching out to the public, police get contacted by two persons that worked with Simone, saying that they had never been interviewed by police before. So they are able to provide some more information and some clarification to Simone's movements and timeline of events for that day. And what we will see, Captain, is immediately with speaking with the people that worked with her and believed that they worked with her on that very day, we can now close that window a little bit from noon to four to more likely 2.30. And it seems like they're very concerned about the 3 to 4 p.m range of that afternoon. So we will see how this ebb and flow of information will slowly shape this investigation over the years. This is a good strategy, not just for this case, but for other cases. I wish law enforcement would do more of this, not just share the information that they know, but also share the questions that they would like to have answered. Well, and one person that we've given praise to plenty of times on this show is Lou Smith great detective, the late, great Lou Smith, who said that every one of his cases, every one of his homicide cases, he would revisit them once a year, every year. If not for any other reason than j just to stir the pot, because information can come about. You shake some trees and you see what comes out. You stop shaking the trees. Nothing's going to fall in your lap. But so back to the timeline, what, what we learned from her coworkers is that she was scheduled to work up till 3 p.m. Well, in part, that has to do with the schedule of the restaurant itself. Right. So it's open for breakfast and lunch, not open for dinner. Simone worked that day, and she had worked there. I'm getting conflicting stories. Some say that she had worked there for that summer, 
And some ha- have said that she worked there on and off for a good part of two years. Now, of course, we're looking at this case in the rearview mirror 46 years later. Some of it gets a little fuzzy, right? The further you get away from this information and from the events back then, it gets a little fuzzy. So we know she was hardworking. We know at the time she actually had her own apartment. And she left her job at the Rainbow Restaurant on South Main Street. And the understanding, the general consensus here, Captain, is that she was going to hitchhike from Natick, Massachusetts to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Yeah, it wasn't uncommon for her to hitchhike, but she would normally just hitchhike back home, which was only a a few miles away. So on February, September 2nd, 1977, it's the Friday of Labor Day weekend, and Simone Reidinger had just finished her shift waitressing at the Rainbow Restaurant on South Main Street in Natick, Massachusetts. Simone's family say that Simone had plans. She was heading to Cape Cod to catch a ferry to Martha's Vineyard, where she was looking forward to meeting up with family at the family's Chappaquiddick Cottage. Yeah, sounds fancy, but I believe this was just a a cabin with no electricity, and they didn't even have phone lines. Yeah, the way that this was described to me is pretty much as a vacation bungalow type of property, the kind of place where it was fantastic to stay for a weekend, a long weekend, maybe even a week but a place that is not really set up or equipped for one to live there for an extended period. Simone has an older stepsister. Her name is Betsy. And Betsy's about two years or so older than Simone. And she would later tell detectives that she stopped by the Rainbow Restaurant on that day, the day in question, to see if Simone wanted a ride to the bus station. She thought her sister would hitch a ride to the bus station get a ride, or she could offer her a ride to the bus station. You got to take the bus all the way out, and then you're going to hop a ferry. So there's a lot of traveling that has to be done, planes, trains, and automobile style here to get to her destination. Yeah, from the Rainbow Restaurant to Cape Cod, we're looking at about 70 miles. So what we have here is, unfortunately, Simone turns down the offering of a ride from her stepsister. And what's unclear to me, Captain, is what time of day this offer came about. I know that it came about in person. Right. Stepsister goes to the restaurant, offers a ride. My guess here is based off of what the later eyewitness reports would be, that this was not at the very end of her shift, that this would have been prior to the end of her shift. Yeah, she might have turned down this ride simply because she couldn't get out of work in time and didn't want to be a hindrance to her like yeah just you know now i gotta finish work how about you just go on your way I'll, i'll be fine there are some that say that simone almost preferred to hitchhike and i don't know what the dynamic of the two's relationship was it sounds like they were fairly close that they were very friendly and they they were in regular contact if not daily contact with each other But I have some other suspicions on maybe why she turned that ride down. And we'll get into that as we go through once we get past our our timeline or at least the known events and details of this day in question. Right. So according to Betsy, the stepsister, this is after a brief interaction with Simone. She learned that Simone was all set, didn't need a ride or didn't want a ride from her. A quick description here. You heard part of it from the captain earlier of our missing persons. At the time of the disappearance, Simone Stephanie Ridinger was age 17, 5 foot 2 inches or 3 inches tall, approximately 115 to 120 pounds with brown eyes and wavy strawberry blonde hair. We've covered so many cases like this, and one of the things that struck me when looking into this case, I don't know if it struck you, but it It seems like there's been a pattern lately where under 5'3", roughly 100 to 120 pounds. We see that time and time again with with descriptions of these victims. Family and friends said that Simone wasn't shy about talking to strangers and meeting new people. 
And due to the fact that Simone would regularly hitchhike rides from both friends, acquaintances, and strangers, it's believed that she planned to hitch a ride to the Cape and that maybe the bus idea was not even in her plans. Simone's sister says, quote, it doesn't surprise me that she would have hitchhiked, end quote. Simone's family and co-workers, they never see her again after this window that afternoon. Now, on September 11, 1977, Simone's mother, her name is Jane Barrett, she walks into the Sherborne police station and reported her daughter missing to Officer George Stevens. Simone's mother in Chappaquiddick on the vineyard for Labor Day weekend This is where we start to see the complications in the timeline. We know that Simone's mother is in Chappaquiddick on the vineyard for the Labor Day weekend. She's there. She just figured that Simone didn't make it out to the island. And as you brought up, the home didn't have electricity or a phone. So it wouldn't be terribly out of the question that she didn't hear from her daughter to let her know, hey, Plans changed. Maybe I have to work. Something came up or I can't get a ride out there. I'm not going to be able to join you for the weekend. Yeah. And a couple of things here. So you have Simone supposed to get out there September 2nd. So at first, like you said, the mom is thinking, well, maybe she met up with some friends. Maybe we'll see her tomorrow. She doesn't show up the next day. Well, maybe she changed her mind. Maybe People at work were like, hey, there's some there's some stuff going on here. Why don't you just stay in town? But like you said, there's no way to check. So that's why there's such a, a, a distance in time. Family doesn't see her on the second. They're not able to report her missing till the, the 11th, right? Yeah, and here what we're seeing, Captain, is truly just a breakdown of communication or a complete lack of communication due to the circumstances. So while you have mom at the cottage, she just assumes that Simone is fine and is back at home. At home, you have stepsister Betsy, who simply believes that her younger stepsister is at the cottage. Right. And from my understanding, this is where the new information, the new stories and the newspaper articles that have come out over the years due to the good work of the Sherborne police really work to kind of clear things up. So they don't shy away from the fact that the investigation was complicated from the beginning. And they also don't shy away from the fact that there were probably persons that should have been interviewed back in 1977 that were not. Well, they made some missteps, and but we see this time and time again. Yeah, she's only 17, but she's living as an adult. See, that's that in there lies a big problem, I feel like, because we hear so many times in these cases where we have a missing teenager and someone says, well, they they probably run away. And I'm not saying it's not always law enforcement that, that says that, but that's an easy leap to make. They probably ran away, especially in the 70s. That's so very common. But here it's like run away from what? They're not living, she's not living with mom and dad. Right. She has her own apartment. She's as independent as a 17-year-old could be. And so runaway here seems to be cross a line through that because that doesn't seem like much of an option to me in this situation. Well, we don't have people saying that she has friends in other states or other cities where she could start a new life or, oh, maybe she has a romantic interest in another state. There's no, there's no rumors of that. And my, my issues with the police in this case or any case where they just go, well, she probably ran away to me. It's just a lazy thought. It's like, no, let's, let's just assume that something bad happened. Let's do the investigation within the next couple of days. We might find out that she left on her own accord and then that's fine. But and one thing that complicates our situation and the storytelling here is we do not know what the interaction was between police and family 
back in 1977. So right. I can't sit here with any confidence and say the police believe that she had run away. And that is why maybe they didn't jump into full on investigation mode. Well, also in defense of law enforcement, when the last known sighting of her is on the second and she's not reported missing, they're not notified till the 11th. So we know how much that first 48, 72 hours is important in an investigation. And you lost that. Yeah. So here, here in lies some of the, the problems, right? The complications with this case. Early on, we have the the facts are that sister back at home, who almost had daily contact with her stepsister, doesn't see Simone and makes the obvious, the assumption that any of us would make. We know she has plans to join mom out at the cottage. Cottage doesn't have a phone. She's probably just out there with her the, this entire time. Right. Mom, on the other hand, believes the opposite. Well, Simone didn't make it out here. She's probably just back at her apartment. Everything's fine. Stepsister and mom don't talk to each other during the course of, of the time frame that we're talking about. The other problem, too, that we later learn is not so much that it was a long Labor Day weekend trip, but the police are now under the belief based of information that they received well after the fact that this was very likely a week long trip for mom out to the cottage. Right. So that is when a lot of suspicion is really truly raised is when mom gets back. So what we have here years later, we'll have the stepsister that will say, you know, she grew a little concerned after the holiday weekend, but again, mom is still out at the cottage. Maybe Simone is, is as well. And it's not until mom gets back that this official missing persons report is is reported to the Sherborne Police Department. The other problem, too, is not just the delay in this report, but also the locations of everything. Okay, so we have multiple locations involved in this very short story. Right? Mom lives in Sherborne. Simone lives in Framingham. She works in Natick. They're supposed to be out at the cottage at Chappaquiddick. So we got four locations involved in a story that really is, you're really trying to hone in on a 24 to 48 hour time period. And well, you got four locations involved in, in, in that time period. Well, and three of the locations are closer together, and then you have, like we said, that 70 miles distance to the Cape. And so that complicates things even more. Onward and upward. Cheers to you, Kurt. Cheers to everybody out there. So we have our missing persons report, right? And as the complaint reads from September 11, 1977, Jane Barrett, and it gives her address here. She lives in Sherborne, as we already discussed, reported her daughter, Simone Stephanie Ridinger, and gives a brief description of her daughter in this complaint as well. She says that the last known whereabouts of her daughter is that Friday, that September 2nd. Jane said that she was supposed to go to the Cape on that day to arrive by the 3rd. So that's a little bit of an interesting piece of information, right? We're talking about this is not a location that would take you a full day to get to. 
but mom is under the understanding that her daughter will be arriving on Saturday. And we know her last day at work was that Friday. But she said that she never had left. And Yeah, I believe the the travel time was also because there's a possibility that Simone would meet up with some friends out on Cape Cod. That that was a possibility. Yes, and we already went through that brief description a couple of times, but to include and add to that, it says on this report, last known to be wearing Indian print purple wraparound skirt, medium brown leather boots. So that's all you get on this report. Now, we do get a follow-up report, and I believe that this one is probably simply from just a month or two months afterward, where we have another report filed. There's no date for this filing. Maybe it's just further information off of the first report, but let's go back to what she was wearing. Last seen wearing Indian wrap skirt, purple boots, broad brim leather hat. Silver jewelry and turquoise stones. And again, this one has the updated information of saying possibly hitchhiking toward Cape Cod. So obviously we know that Simone worked at the Rainbow Restaurant that day. Mm-hmm. We have eyewitnesses that say that she worked there. We have her stepsister that said she was working there that day. We don't have a definitive time of the last time somebody saw her. Seems like that is a little blurry between 2.30 and 3. And yeah, I, and the, I think in part the noon to 4. Right. Look, a couple of these people that came forward years and decades later that worked at the Rainbow Restaurant told police, we were not interviewed. I, I was not questioned back then in 1977, and here is what I remember. But one thing that I think that police did do well, and it was smart to do so, in that original BOLO, the the missing persons report that went out to the public to be on the lookout for, when they originally had that window of noon to four, I think that's quite responsible because I think they, you know, people aren't walking around tracking every minute of their day. And I think that, that was a bit of a strategy to say, you know what, we don't want anybody to exclude something based off of if they have information, but it's a half an hour different outside of the window that we believe we should be looking at here. And so that is is a good way for people to not dismiss anything and still come forward. And frankly, to be with this case, Police are saying at this point, we welcome any and all information as they have for, for many years about Simone's case. Like you don't have to know what happened to her. Right. You also don't have to believe that you were one of the last people to have seen her. We are really just trying to fill in the blanks of her life and the events of her life in that last couple of months before she went missing. So really, if you know anything about her, Please let us know so we can we can work to put together a more comprehensive timeline and more information about our victim here. One of the, one of the questions I had for you when I was looking into this is if Simone was working at like a, a gift shop and they closed at three, then all the employees would leave together. But because it's a restaurant and like we said, we've kind of we kind of narrowed it down from that 12 to four time period to closer to 3 PM. Correct. But, but I wonder if that, and and maybe you can speak on this more because of your knowledge of restaurants, but normally if the restaurant is getting slower, that they start releasing uh, waiters and waitresses. Yeah. You rarely do you, that that's one of the annoying parts of working at a restaurant of, in my experience anyway, is that if a friend or someone that you're, you're trying to hang out with after work says, Hey, what time, what time will you be done? You kind of got to ballpark it a little bit for them because often there's no set time to leave unless you're like a closer, right? If, unless you know that you're going to be there up until the moment that the doors close, then, you know, it usually takes me 
X amount of minutes to clean everything up, clean up my station, do my outwork, and I'll be leaving 30 to 40 minutes. As long as I don't have any squatters in the restaurant, I will should be leaving 30, 40 minutes after we close. In this situation, I actually think that that is probably very close to, to the situation, okay? So we know that this is a restaurant that was only open for breakfast and lunch, not open for dinner at all. And a lot of times in these cases, and I can't say that this is absolutely true. This is just going off of an educated guess. But a lot of times at these types of establishments, because they have shortened hours that they're open, right? a lot of times people are working the breakfast and lunch shift. And so in Simone's case here, I think that it's pretty safe to say based off of two different eyewitnesses, two different people that were working with her that day, that she worked up until pretty close to the, the time that the restaurant closed. In fact, may have worked through the closing time and then left the restaurant shortly afterward. According to these two eyewitnesses who worked with her that day, they say that the last they saw Simone riding her, she walked out the front door of the restaurant. She, everybody was well aware of her plans and they saw her immediately attempting to hitch a ride, thumb in the air, looking for a pickup on that street. Now that street is main street and it, the nearest intersection goes directly south east west and then north but it curves a little bit so it's really difficult to this is not a country road out in the middle of nowhere where you can immediately go well she either went north or south no she could have hopped in a car and, and very quickly within a matter of seconds been heading in any direction that afternoon so i think the, really the time frame that that we're really trying to pinpoint here is like that 3 p.m to maybe 4 p.m. at the very latest based off of two persons that worked with her that day. I have some conflicting information from what you have because one of the eyewitnesses that said she let, saw her leave around 3 p.m., she had a duffel bag with her and so that she changed her clothes. And so they were saying that she was seen in blue jeans, white T-shirt, and white high tops. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Same jewelry as you were stating before. Yeah, so the if you look, there's a VICAP alert for Simone Reidinger. And this is due in part to, as we pointed out, the Sherborne Police Department's continued work on her case. So this VICAP report comes in in 2017. This is Sherborne Police working to get the FBI involved in this missing persons case. So you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes or Adrian Monk to figure out what that means. That means that they believe that foul play is involved, that that is why Simone is still missing. That she encountered, met with foul play, and someone has concealed her to this day, that we've not been able to find her to this day. So the FBI are involved. They had the state police involved, in, and there's been other organizations. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children have been involved in this case. We know that because they were the ones that did the age progression of what she may look like today. I think they did that in 2017 as well. Right. But the VICAP report states, Attention Homicide Missing Persons and Crime Analysis Units. So those are the people that they are alerting about her being missing. And they give a couple pictures here of Simone. They give a fairly zoomed in picture of her left hand that's really kind of displaying some of that jewelry that we were talking about. But you're exactly right, Captain. This report, which is the, the most recent one, gives a much different description of what Simone was wearing that day, blue jeans with rips and patches, a white t-shirt, white high top sneakers, and a lot of silver jewelry. Also, Simone was carrying a gray duffel bag with her waitress uniform inside. The waitress uniform is described as a dark blue polyester skirt and vest top. And the VICAP alert includes a drawing of this 
polyester skirt and vest top. Okay, so there's a little bit of background information here on, on this description. What's difficult is we do not know where the, the first description comes from. It sounds like it comes straight from her mother when she walked in and reported her daughter missing. Why they came up with that outfit, we don't know. How did they come up with this other outfit? Well, we know that. This outfit is what the two waitresses that were interviewed years, decades later say, this is what I remember her to be wearing. And what's interesting is these two persons are giving this description independently to the detectives. Right. So it seems to stand to reason that this is a very likely what she was last seen wearing in these confirmed sightings by persons that are identifiable that they've spoke to directly. This gray duffel bag is kind of a common occurrence here at this restaurant. So the, the waitresses tell the detectives years later, look, that uniform, all of us hated it, right? We all hated that uniform and almost every one of us would change in the the restroom at work before even leaving, before even going out the front doors of that restaurant. Well, I think this duffel bag kind of complicates things because this outfit, maybe like you said, described by the mother, maybe she had multiple outfits in that duffel bag. We don't know. We don't have any waitress coming forward saying, I saw her open the duffel bag and I looked through it. Right. So where my head goes to here is, Based off of what we have the two waitresses saying that we all hated the uniform, everybody changed out of it before even leaving our shift, I'm guessing that she arrives to work in her work uniform or other clothes and that inside the gray duffel bag when she arrives at work is this clothes, clothing that we've just described, the blue jeans with rips and patches, the white t-shirt, and the uh, possibly even the sneakers. Maybe she's wearing those. And then she leaves before leaving work. She changes out of the work uniform, which go then goes into the gray duffel bag. And now she puts on this outfit. The reason why I say that, because a lot of the early newspaper reports, they're interviewing the stepfather. They're interviewing the mother. They're interviewing the sister. And, and all of them are kind of saying the same thing. You know, the only thing that she had was clothing that she would have taken with her for the trip for the weekend. Or, you know, now we hear that maybe mom was there for a whole week. The waitresses are saying something different. And I don't, I don't sit here and pretend that they would know 100% what is in this gray duffel bag. I trying to point out that I don't necessarily think that maybe her first destination was to the bus stop or to out to where she could catch a ferry to Chappaquiddick. I'm starting to wonder if she doesn't have any clothing with her or anything else in that gray duffel bag other than her work uniform. Was she intending her intent to return to her apartment first? Right. And maybe possibly that has something to do with turning down the ride with her sister. And that she had one more, two more, three more stops to make before she was going to make her way out to see mom. Because now we can cross-reference this information with what mom told the police September 11, 1977. My daughter, it was my understanding that she was going to arrive on that Saturday. And I know she left work on that Friday. We have a big window of time there between those two air quotes, scheduled events. This is one of the points of the case that just frustrates the hell out of me. And we can't re-interview her because she has since passed away. It's when you have everybody that has been interviewed, everybody that has come forward that worked at that restaurant, they're stating that she is going out to Cape Cod that day. By all accounts, she was telling us what she was doing over the weekend. We don't know if she was going to be there for just the weekend or if she was going to be there for like a week like her, her mother was. But it's just so strange to me that the mother wasn't expecting her till the following day. Because mm -hmm. like you said, well, then 
Maybe she'd go back home. Maybe she wouldn't leave till the morning. But that doesn't make sense with the fact that the stepsister offered her a ride. To the bus station that day. Again, what we do know from some of the comments that the mother made is that she said, well, when she didn't show up, I thought maybe she ran into some friends at Cape Cod. So, you know, there's there's these these gray areas. And just like this case is so frustrating, too, because she goes missing, last seen on the 2nd, not reported until the 11th. Yeah. And, and, and it's by nobody's fault. It's just what happened. And then law enforcement questions a couple people. Nobody's fault, but there's not much information there. So it's like, well, maybe she just ran away. You're doing exactly what law enforcement has done over the years. It's because I'm a Where they're saying that, hey, this is what we would like to know. This is the information that we're seeking in this case. It's the discrepancies in some of these stories. Now, there could be a perfectly reasonable explanation for all of this. We just don't know because we don't have the information. Yes. But yes, the, the, to break it down in its simplest form, why is mother expecting Simone on the third and persons she works with and stepsisters seem to be under the impression that she's going out there on the second? And it's not a greater, great enough distance that she would leave the afternoon of the second and not arrive until Saturday, the third. Right. She would be there relatively early in the evening, Saturday, or sorry, Friday night, if she was able to, to make it directly from either her apartment or her work and head and get there in a reasonable time frame. She would be out there Friday evening. So why is there this discrepancy in, in these situations? Why is mom under one belief and all these other people are under another belief? Now, we talked about the waitresses saying that they were not interviewed. We don't have any reason to not believe them, right? What, what, what's the point in them saying, right. well, yeah, nobody bothered to talk to us. What we do believe, based off of information that we've reviewed, is that there were people at the restaurant that were talked to in 1977. We we have every reason to believe that the owner, who was very well-liked, personable with the staff and employees, and personable with Simone, he was interviewed. We know that her parents were interviewed in 77, as well as... So she was not attending school at the time. We no. should probably fill in some of the she, blanks of Simone's life. Yeah, she dropped out of high school, and her plan was... To get her GED. Plan was to get the GED. She she enjoyed working. We know that she she didn't shy away from working and for and from earning. She had her own place. What she didn't have was a vehicle or a driver's license. It's a little gray on when she dropped out of school. Some some say that it was after her sophomore year. Some say after her junior year. What we can say for certain is this is right around what would be the start of a new school year. So what we can say is that we know that she's not been in school since school ended going into that summer. Right. And she disappears at the end of the summer. We know that she gets her own apartment. She gets her own apartment. From my understanding, it's about two months, approximately two months before she goes missing. This apartment is incredibly interesting to me for a multitude of reasons here, Captain. The story has always been that mom helped her get this apartment, probably needed to, to sign something to, to vouch for her daughter because her daughter's not 18 yet. Yeah, it's hard um, to say because it was 1977. Correct. But I'm sure that the persons wanted to make sure that they were going to get paid. And, and I'm stating this information of mother helping daughter find the apartment and get set up based off of what the police are saying. Right. So they say that mom helped Simone get this apartment, but the apartment seems to be a big mystery because the first thing I wanted to know from detectives is, well, we have all this, these things that we're questioning. We have all this, this stuff that we just don't know. 
I don't understand why we don't know more about the apartment. So she, what we do know is she lived on the, the ground level of this apartment. There were persons that lived on the ground level and lived in the upstairs as well. She had her own space, her own apartment in this, what sounds like a building to me. And I do have the address here, which, you know, the, the problem is, it seems to me, Captain, like most of the work done on this case is has been done years after the fact. And so there's a lot of information that they hope to learn, but may never learn. So the address was 29 Linden Street, Framingham. And the first thing I said to detectives was, well, people pay taxes, properties pay taxes. We got to find the tax information on this property. The brick wall that you run into unfortunately head first every damn time is going to be, you know, they only started a lot of times they only started digitizing those tax records at a certain year. Okay. So they only make their way to computers at a certain year. And oftentimes they're only going back so many years. I can tell you from experience, a case, a a case from the seventies that I was working on myself, I could only find tax records going back to the early eighties. And so once I hit 1981, I hit that brick wall. No more information that I could gain via computer on the tax records for that particular property. I'm assuming the same has happened here. And then on top of that, if you were able to figure out who was paying the property tax, i.e. the owner of this building that was leasing a space to our missing person, is even if you do find that person's name, are they even around anymore to talk to them? To ask them, what do you know? Where's your paperwork from 1977? Probably don't have it. So I wanted to know more about the persons that were living in this building and what they would have known. Did they see anybody coming or going regularly from Simone's apartment? Was there anybody that they were suspicious of? Yeah, that makes sense. Because... The police are here to tell us, and it's no more evident than in the VICAP report. You don't just, you don't call up the FBI and do a VICAP report unless you think that this person was met with foul play. Yeah, the MF FBI. So everyone is saying this is a murder case. Unfortunately, we are at a time frame and at a period in this investigation and have been for a very long time where we are now not looking for a missing person. We are looking for remains. Thank you for joining us here in the garage today. If you are a member of law enforcement or a first responder and you have a case from your jurisdiction that you would like featured on True Crime Garage, please go to our website, truecrimegarage.com, and look up our contact information. And until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't litter.